Oh, that's loud. Well, I'm going to speak from down here today, if that's okay. The lights kind of blind me up there, and with what I'm talking on today, I felt like it would be more appropriate anyway. Um, you know, we've been kind of doing a series here at the church, um, God Gives. And um, I know Pastor talked on God Gives Peace, and Josh talked on God Gives Liberty, and Thomas talked on God Gives Wisdom. And for some reason, they asked me to teach on God Gives Grace. I can't imagine why. Um, I know that's, that's the only message I ever preach is, is the grace of God. <laughs> Um, I heard Andrew Womack say one time, he said, I preach the same message. He wasn't talking about me, he was talking about himself. He said, I preach the same message over and over. I just use different words. And, uh, and I, I think I kind of feel, like, um, feel like him in, in that regard. And this morning, please don't tune me out because all of a sudden, oh, Tad's talking about grace again. I really want you to, to listen. Um, the reason I say that is, I know this works. I know it works. Um, it's kind of like we have, a, we have a, me and some guys have a little investing club or whatever that we meet once a month and we'll shoot texts back and forth and, and they'll tell you if, I, if there's a company that I think is just a great company, I'm like hammering out the texts you know, several times a week. I'm just pounding the table. You know, uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a great company. I even called Jim Cramer's Mad Money this week and got on. Um, anyway, not that anybody cares. Um, but the fact is when I get something that is in my heart and I, I believe it, even if it's something as small and really as insignificant as that, I pound the table. And I'm pounding the table this morning. The grace of God works. The message of the gospel works. There may be other things that work. I've not found anything that works as good. Good principles you know, can go so far, but good principles work for anybody. Biblical principles are wonderful and they're good. And I hope my neighbor, if I have unsaved neighbors, I hope they live by biblical principles because I don't have to worry about them coming up and, and stealing something when I'm not home. I hope they live by good principles. But they don't work like the grace of God. They're, 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 they're the ABCs. They're the beginners. They're, Renee was talking about a, a little baby crawling. That's, that's good principles or that. Um, the grace of God within itself has the power to do whatever we need in our lives and to provide for us wherever we find ourselves. That's, why, that's one of the reasons I want to step down here, not just because the lights, although they do kind of blind me sometimes, is because the grace of God meets us wherever we're at. I don't care if, if, if someone is, if you are uh, living homeless on the streets and, 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 and you're a crack addict and, and you're a thief and you're, you just fill in the blanks. I'm telling you, if you hear the gospel and you believe it, it works every single time. And oftentimes we limit the gospel or the grace of God to somebody just getting born again and, and, and into the kingdom. Listen, that's, that you're just getting started there. The grace of God that will meet a guy or a woman on the streets in, in those situations and, and transform their lives in a moment, that same grace of God is at work in somebody that seemingly you know, has, has been a Christian for, for 30 years and, and things are going well and they're enjoying the blessings of God. But guess what? Everybody has need and everybody has need of the grace of God. It's not something that, oh, I got that. Let's move on to something deeper. It is the gospel. And, and within the gospel is everything that God has provided for us. And it does work. It, it has inherently in it, it has power. It's, that's where the power of God's release is, is in the gospel. You know, and this is not something that I heard some uh, TV preacher talk about. This is something that I know for real absolutely works. Because I've been, I've been on the side of things not working as a believer I've been there. I've lived with the guilt and the condemnation and, the, um, and, and you fill in the blanks. And I, I, so I was a Christian. I was a Christian and didn't know anything about the grace of God. I thought the grace of God was just getting born again, and then I'm kind of on my own. But when I found out that the grace of God applies to me every day of life, and I began, when I discovered and began to believe the grace of God, 
Can I tell you, my life was transformed. It was, no, I still got a long way to go. Come live with me for 24 hours and you'll see, boy, you got a lot of transformation that you still need taking place. But I'm not where I was. I may not have arrived yet, but I've left the station. And it's, it's, the, it's the grace of God that's found in what Christ Jesus has done for us. I, I can't even tell you how it works. I don't know how someone dying on a cross 2,000 years ago, taking upon my sin, being buried and raised from the dead, and he says, if you'll believe it and you'll put faith in me, you can have new life. That, that, I, don't, I don't know how that works. But it works, and it works better than anything I've found. I've seen it work on, 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 the, on crusade platforms in India. I've seen blind eyes open and, and cripples get up and walk and, and people that were bound by demons for 10, 20 years be set free in a moment by hearing the gospel and believing the gospel. But that's, that, and that sounds dramatic and, and wild, and it is dramatic, and, and there's nothing like that. But guess what? I've seen it work at 505 Berry Oak Road, too in life, in the daily struggles of life, in, in, um, in making life what life was intended to be. This is real. This is gospel. You know what they say, that's the gospel truth? This is really the gospel truth. You know, all truth is not gospel truth. Gospel truth is the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and all that he accomplished within that and, um, you know, we, we throw away, so, so listen to me. I say all that as a prelude to please listen this morning um, because I tell you, we can never hear the gospel too much. Um, the word gospel comes from a word, it's a Greek word that means charis. And, and if you ask a lot of folks on the street, believers, you know, what is, what is the grace of God, the unmerited favor of God? And that is an accurate direct. Uh, definition. There's nothing wrong with it, but it doesn't go nearly far enough. I mean, that, that, that doesn't go nearly far enough, the unmerited favor of God. It is that. It is unmerited, but it means gift. It means benefit. And, and my favorite definition of the grace of God is, I want you to listen to this, the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. It's God himself coming to you and finding you where you are and impacting you in a very positive way, in a God kind of way. Listen, when God impacts you, it's always positive. Religion's taught us a bunch of dumb stuff. And most of us have spent years trying to unlearn it. I'm almost envious of folks that get born again and they've never, um, they've never been to a church or they've never been part of religion, although that's hard to find. Because, man, they, they, they don't come with, with years and years of baggage that they have to somehow toss out because sometimes it's tough to toss out things that we've bound ourselves to. But it's the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. It's also where we get the word gift from. And it means gift, but there's another word, charisma, in the Greek that means gift. And it's a divine endowment. It's a, it, one definition of it is it's a gratuity, a divine gratuity. What's a gratuity? It's a tip, right? I mean, you, you, give some, you go to a restaurant and you give somebody a tip. And it's a, but it's a divine tip. It's a divine endowment, a divine gratuity. Now, when we go to a restaurant and tip, we typically do it because somebody's serving us and they've given us good service, and, um, or sometimes not. You know, how awesome would it be to give a great tip when somebody's having a bad day? That's probably when we really need to give a good tip. But it's different in this because of the divine gratuity, because the Scripture says that we were enemies of God. We were enemies of God, and he decided to give us a divine gratuity. He gifted us with something, something supernatural, a supernatural endowment. I've heard folks say that the grace of God is Jesus Christ, and I, I believe that. He, he's the grace of God personified. I've heard others say the grace of God is the Holy Spirit, and I believe that because, I mean, he speaks what the Father says. He, he's God, right? And I believe God the Father's the grace of God, too. They, they, they exhibit the grace of God. They pour out his grace uh, grace is a huge word that we couldn't begin to cover in, in one session, but I want to share, share some stories about the grace of God this morning, and we're going to get into the scriptures. But I want to read out of Ephesians. Um, I gave Albert one scripture, but I'm actually going to read more, so he may or may not want to put it up. But it starts in Ephesians uh, chapter 1. It says, um, 
Uh, let's see, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. In chapter two, this is the pass I actually gave Albert, verse eight. It says, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. Now that's a scripture that if you're a Christian, you've been in church very long, you've heard that many, many times. For by grace you're saved. But it's still true. It's the grace of God that saves us. And it's the grace of God that doesn't just save us to get us born again. It's the grace of God that saves us on a continual basis. How many of of y'all have areas of life you need to be saved in? I'm not talking about being born again, I'm talking about areas of your life that you need the power of God to visit and touch and help. I do. I got lots of areas like that. Um, I, I, I need that on a daily basis, the grace of God. The grace of God is not something we move past, that we discover, and as I said earlier, go on to something deeper. It's something that impacts our daily life. And when I see an area of my life that's lacking, I don't think I need to pull myself up by my bootstraps. I've, I do a really crappy job pulling myself up by my bootstraps. Can we say crappy in church? I guess we can. I mean, I do a really bad job of that. I've said before, I'm a ter- don't give me a self-help book. Every time I try to help myself, I just think make things worse. It's the grace of God. It's the grace of God that works on the inside. What would Paul say? I, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, but yet not I, Christ in me. And he, and he talks about it's the grace of God at work within us that does these things. And that word says that we're saved by grace. And, and I do believe Paul's talking about salvation in terms of being born again, coming into the kingdom of God. But that word there for saved is a really big word, and it's not limited to being born again. It's being healed. It's being made whole in our life. It certainly means being born again and brought into right standing with God, but it it means our whole person is saved. Our whole person experiences his grace and and is saved and is impacted by that. And that's God's desire for all mankind, to be saved, to be whole, not just to make it to heaven, but actually to experience some heaven on earth, to, to be made whole in this life, to live the way God intended man to live. Not be, you know, there's a lot of things in the Scripture, and even in the New Testament, there's a lot of instructions uh, where Paul will talk about, you know, uh, you know he, he'll usually start off letters by talking about the wonders of the gospel and the wonders of Jesus and all he's done and all he's accomplished. And usually toward the end of the letter, he'll write a section that I would call, Don't Be Stupid. And in that section, he'll basically say, you know, avoid this and don't do this and avoid this. And it's not, it's not that he's saying, you know, you're going to lose your salvation if you do this or God's going to be really ticked off if you do this. He's saying, this, this is how this thing works its way out in our life. And, and not because God does, is against having fun. It's because God knows the best way. God knows the way things were intended to be. And, and God wants the best for everybody. God wants life for everybody. God didn't put commands in the scripture to somehow limit people because he was really a downer and didn't like people to have good times. It was because he knew he knew what life could be like. And he knew if it was going to be lived like, like, he does, like, like man would be fulfilled in it, it would fall under certain parameters of that. But it still comes back to this grace of God that saves us. There's a passage I want to read in, in Hebrews. You know, Jesus has accomplished everything for us. I mean, he's all, you know, Jesus sat down. I mean, he sat down for a reason. It wasn't because he was tired. He sat down because he was finished. Is this thing falling? I feel like it's falling. If, if I, I know Thomas was preaching. It went kind of crazy. I want to avoid that. So um, anyway, he sat down because his work at the cross was finished, and he had accomplished everything that needed to be accomplished for mankind to be restored to the way man was intended to be. He did. And oftentimes we approach God as though he's done nothing. You know, we beg God to do all the things that sometimes I wonder if God's saying, I did that. <laughs> you know, I did that. You can read that in Isaiah 53 or you can read that in another passage. 
But he's accomplished all these things already on our behalf. And we're not, having, we're not in a position where we have to beg God to do the things that he's already provided for in Christ Jesus. No, our prayer and our talking to God about those things do help us yield and open up the door for those things to be manifested in our life. But believe me, he's already made provision for it. He's not, come, he's not getting off his throne to come down and say, you know, I didn't quite finish the work. It is done. We do need the Holy Spirit. We do need prayer and, and communion with God, communicating with God about you know, enjoying these things and receiving these things. But make no mistake about it, it has been done. Hebrews chapter 4 says, uh, in verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest, and he's talking about Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. It says, let us draw near with confidence. I love what the Amplified Bible says. It says, let us draw near with fearlessness to God to find grace and mercy in the time of need. Listen, this is, the book is written to Hebrew, and there's a story behind Hebrews, but a lot of believers would have read this. We need it. We need it. We need the grace of God daily. We need to feed on it and, 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 and taste of it and talk about it and celebrate it and rejoice in it in what God has done in Christ Jesus. And, and this speaks of, of in these times of need. And some times of need are, are seemingly worse than others. I mean, there are times where things are going well in our life and there are times where they're not going so well. But he says, in time of need, whenever you have need, come and receive the grace of God. And you know, the wonderful thing about grace is it is totally undeserved. You know the only thing that can short-circuit grace? It's trying to work for it. It's trying to get it. Grace is something to be received. So, let me tell you something. Sin is not a disqualifier for the grace of God. I don't care. Listen, sin is a qualifier for the grace of God. If you didn't have failures, you wouldn't need it. Sin makes you a candidate for the grace of God. Don't ever think you've sinned your way out of the grace of God or you're too far beyond the grace of God. Paul even said, listen, where sin abounds, I mean where it's overflowing, grace much more abounds. I don't care if you are the worst of, I mean, you, you look at yourself in the mirror and you think there has never been a human that has failed as miserably as I have. God says, listen, that's nothing in comparison with my grace. Where that sin is, my grace super abounds. It super abounds. It, it, sin can't hold a candle to the grace of God. It super abounds. That is, that is God himself coming to you and saying, it's okay. It's okay because I've paid a price for it in, in the body of Jesus Christ. He has borne, in a single moment in time, Jesus bore the sins of the world. Every sin that had ever been committed or ever would be committed, every calamity, every sickness, every disease, every mental torment, and those can be the worst. You know, it's one thing when we miss it. What really, what really tortures us is, um, is what comes after. It's that mental torment. And Scripture says that, that, that part of his suffering was that we might have peace of mind. It says his, his punishment, the punishment he bore was that we might have peace of mind. That's not for just people that have it together and actually don't have anything to sweat. It's for us, the screw-ups, the ones that have totally fouled up in areas of our life. God comes and says, look, I, I've, I've paid for that. It's all, you can experience my grace and you you can move on from this. You know, there's a, um, uh, a friend of ours uh, has a, has a, uh, had a friend in Florida that was a, a, a pastor. And this pastor really got a hold of the grace, of the love of God. And um, he didn't know much about the love of God. I know it sounds funny for a pastor not to know much about the love of God. But you know what? I mean, a lot of us don't know a lot, a lot of things that we should. 
But this pastor really got a hold of the love of God. And um, so he, he was gonna preach this series at his church on the love of God. And he gets up and he begins to preach. And I mean, it's really awesome. And at the end, there was, there was a guy there that he didn't know. And at the end, uh, he's, he's greeting some people. And this guy comes up to him and, and gave, gives him what's, what I've heard referred to as a gospel handshake. He shakes his hand and he's got a check in it. And he hands it to the pastor. And the pastor sticks it in his pocket. And the guy says, you know, he said, I hadn't been to church in years. Decades. He said, um, he said, because I kind of figure there's no real place for me in church. And he said, um, he said, Pastor, he said, I, I didn't know God could love somebody like me. He said, this morning I got up and just felt to come to a church, and that's why I ended up in your church. He said, I just didn't know God could love somebody like me. So, you know, I don't know what the pastor said to him, but the guy leaves, and the pastor goes back to his office, and all of a sudden he pulls out the check at some point. He remembers it. And it's, it's, the check is for $50,000. It's a true story. And he says, um, uh, and he looks at that, and of course that would blow your mind right there. I'm glad you're sitting down because the check the, 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 had the name of the man's company. And the name of the man's company was something like uh, uh, Susanna's um, uh, Massage Parlor, something like that. This guy ran one of the largest prostitutes prostitution rings in South Florida. And he was writing, and he wrote this check out on Susanna's thing. Somebody said, would you cash that check? Yeah. Anyway, so the pastor did. The pastor cashed the check. And the man kept coming back to the, to the services, and, and he, began, he kept hearing about the love of God, the love of God, the love of God, the grace of God. And, and some word somehow seeped out among the congregation. Apparently, some folks knew who he was. No, my question is, How'd they know who he was? But anyway, the word snaked out that who this was, and some of the leaders came to the pastor, some of the different, or the members came and said, you need to do something about this. You need, I mean, that man's still operating his business. It's not shut down. I was there, I mean, somebody was there last week. Now, I mean, so they're like, you know, how, how can you, how can you, you've got to address this situation. And the pastor said, I will. And the pastor went back to his office and prayed about it, and the Holy Spirit said, you protect that man from those people. You protect that man from those people. Whoa. So he did. He didn't, he didn't do anything. Well, services kept going on. Long story short, all of a sudden, one day that man walks in with a bunch of his girls that were prostitutes, that he, you know, was their pimp or employer. And they, and they all, and there wasn't any, there wasn't much seats. They all had to sit down front. And guess what? Those gals, they didn't have a lot of Sunday to go to meet and close. And he said, he said, that poor praise and worship leader was up there trying to lead praise and worship, and he was just getting off into the flame. It was, just, it was a mess. But anyway, but anyway, but you know what? All those girls and that guy, they heard the gospel. He brought them there so they could experience salvation like he had experienced. And all those girls, they got born again. You know, it was just a matter of time. He shut down all his businesses, shut down all that stuff he was involved in, Shut it off. Listen, that's the grace of God at work in somebody's life. That's the divine influence upon somebody's heart and upon their life. That's what hearing the gospel will do for somebody. That's what he, what, what if that man, what if that preacher had shut that down and torn that check up and said, I don't want your filthy, you know, money from that industry. Uh, you think that man would have gotten born again? I don't think so. It, that past would have robbed him of an opportunity to experience the grace of God. That is a picture of the grace of God. And there's multiple pictures throughout the scriptures of, of the grace of God. We see where, look at, look at uh, Mary Magdalene, a prostitute, and, and Jesus casts seven devils out of her, and she becomes one of the closest followers of Jesus Christ. Listen, the people that loved being around Jesus were those types of folks. It was a religious crowd that had a hard time with him. And it was the grace of God that they experienced. They experienced the grace of God even before he went to the cross. They got, I mean, he's the son of God. He had the right to extend it, right? He had the right to extend some things on credit that, they, that, we, that we were going to have access to fully after the resurrection. And he did. And they, and they could experience that grace and that love. And, 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 and see, people get nervous when you talk about the grace of God because they think, oh, well, you're just giving people license to go off and do what they want. Well, guess what? People go off and do what they want anyway. Um, it doesn't. The grace of God, it has a power within it. 
The, the Romans says, Paul says in, in the book of Acts, he, call, he says, I, my mission basically is to solemnly testify to the gospel of God's grace. He calls the gospel the gospel of God's grace. So anywhere you see the word gospel, you can say the gospel of his grace. He says, that's the mission God gave me. Paul also wrote in Romans, it's the gospel that's the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believes. That's where the power is. It's in that gospel. It's in that message of God's grace. And listen, that message has the power to save and that message has the power to restore and fix and heal and show up in life. In the book of Titus, Paul says, it's the grace of God that teaches us holiness. We, we thought it was the Ten Commandments. It wasn't. That's Old Covenant, folks. We live in the new. It's called, it, it's called the old for a reason. It's old. It's old. We live in the light of the new covenant where, where God lives on the inside of us and operates by the grace. I'm not, I'm not against the Ten Commandments. I think the Ten Commandments are fantastic. But guess what? They don't, they don't hold a candle to Christ himself living on the inside of me by the Holy Spirit. I, I heard my sister told me something the other day. I really like somebody had shared this idea that somebody had gone to heaven and, and they saw David and they said, oh my goodness, David, what was it like to kill Goliath? And they saw Mo, uh, Noah, Moses, and they said, Moses, what was it like to part the Red Sea? And David and, and, David and Moses looked at that person and says, nah, tell me, what was it like to have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you? Oh, that's the grace of God. That's what the grace of God opens up for us to have access to. No, I, I've mentioned that it's, it's certainly it's for the person that, that is, is not born again and needs God in their life, needs to be born again. Guess there is a difference, folks. There are two races in the earth. It's Adam's race and Christ, and we're in one or the other. And certainly it's this message of God's grace and hearing it, hearing about the forgiveness, hearing about what he has accomplished on our behalf that we might receive of his life and his goodness and his forgiveness. But, it's, uh, but it is also for the believer. It continues. There's a passage in, in Romans that I really wanted to get to, and we'll, we'll hit it for a few minutes. It says, it says, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Listen, we get born again when we believe the gospel of God's grace, when we believe what Jesus has done, when we believe that he paid for our sins, that he died, that he was raised from the dead. We receive that. But we continue to receive of his grace and Paul says, and we reign in life. He wrote to the Colossians talking about the gospel, and he was talking about how the gospel is bearing fruit. And he said, and the God, just like he said, just like the gospel's continuing to bear fruit in your lives since you came to understand, came to understand the grace of God. It's found in Colossians one. It continues to work in the believer's life. It continues to, to, to cause things to happen, to, for life to spring up where there was death. It causes us to reign. And I want, I want to tell you, it doesn't mean that, um, that, that, our, that tragedies don't happen. But even in the midst of tragedy, we can reign. We can reign. God's grace is there. It's there, it's, it, and it's real, and it's substantial. One of the first things the scripture says is, Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. That's, that's, the, that's the first announcement Jesus made about his own ministry. The spirit of the Lord is upon me to heal the brokenhearted. He didn't say the spirit of the Lord is upon me to help the brokenhearted cope. He didn't say he came to help the brokenhearted cope. He came to heal. He came to heal. And I want to tell you, it's not God that brings calamity. It's not God that brings tragedy. Religion will tell you that it's God that brings tragedy and calamity. Jesus went around fixing that stuff all the time. That's why he healed the sick. It wasn't, it wasn't God. It wasn't. 
God has good plan. Now, we live in a fallen world. Where, where things happen. But I'm telling you, we also, as believers, have received the Spirit of God. And Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And you can overcome it too. Christ on the inside of you by the Holy Spirit. Even in difficult things, when times are good and when times are bad, it's leaning and relying and leaning into the grace of God. It's leaning into and relying on the person of the Holy Spirit in those times. And we can go through, because listen, life is full of difficult situations. Some are far worse than others. But no matter where you find yourself, it, we're called to lean into that grace of God. To, to, I don't know any other way to describe it. Uh, there's other ways, I'm sure, probably much better. But to, to receive of that. Notice Paul said, it's those who receive the abundance of grace. Not those who work for it, not those who try to earn it. It's those who just receive it. Just accept it. Just accept it as though it's true. It's not, you're not going to get it by doing mental gymnastics or, 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 or doing some good work for God. It's not a gratuity that's paid based on merit. Well, it is actually, but it's the merits of Jesus Christ. It's not our merits. It's his merits. And it's to be received. And if there are areas in our lives where we see that maybe I'm not experiencing his life like I want to, Maybe I'm not experiencing victory or, or whatever adjective or noun you want to place on it. That's an area where I need to receive of his grace. That's an area I need to receive. And, and it, guess what? It's okay to ask God, how do, how do I receive your grace in this? That, a lot of times we just th throw up prayers like, you know, machine gun fire. You know, we, I'm going to, okay, I'm going to confess. I'm going to do this. I'm going I'm I'm to do all these things. And sometimes we just need to be quiet and say, God, I'm having a hard time receiving from you in this. And I need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. And James says, you know, let, let any man, you can ask for wisdom. God doesn't even find fault with you. He'll give it to you. He'll give it to you. He's fine with that. It, sometimes we, we react. Thomas mentioned a couple weeks ago about reacting to situations, reacting. He, had a re, he said he refused to react years ago when his wife was diagnosed with cancer. He said, I refuse to react to that. I'm not going to react. I'm going to, in essence, follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Ask God, how do, I, how do I deal with this situation? How do, I, how do I receive? I know you have your best intentions. You want me to experience your grace. How, how can I experience it? And you know what? Holy Spirit is so more than willing to show us how to receive. And you know, I, I see the miracles that Jesus did. And he never did things twice the same, the same way, it doesn't seem like. I mean, he, you know, he'd lay hands on one guy that's blind. Another, he'd make mud. And you know, one person would touch the hem of his garment. You know, it's almost like God says, I just want you to receive. And I'm like, whatever, ever, I, I, I want you to receive. I've, crea I've created an endless bounty of ways to receive. And sometimes we just need to ask, how, how do I receive of this? How do I receive? I've shared this story in, in our DNA class. I don't know if I've shared it in Sunday morning. But I was hit with gallbladder attacks a couple, a year ago. Brutal attacks. I mean, horrible. I mean, like laying in the shower for all night long with hot water, melting my skin off because it was the only thing that would give relief. And I knew that wasn't God. And this is small. Listen, that's small potatoes, a gallbladder attack. Didn't feel small. Potatoes. That's a pretty small thing. But I'd had multiple ones. And I knew, I, God, I know this isn't your plan for me. Jesus healed stuff like this and a lot bigger stuff. But you know what? Holy Spirit, how do I receive from you? And you know, he, he said, the Lord spoke this to me. This is my body broken for you. Okay, so you know, I, start, I started taking communion, not as some kind of superstition, not as some kind of system, but it was a time, the Holy Spirit knew it was a time that I could set aside and, and, and focus and meditate on what God had done for me. And you know what? I hadn't had one since. And they were, I'm talking, folks, they were getting worse and worse and worse, and they were so bad. Now that, that's something so small in the light of the, what, what takes place and, and what we face in life, but it, but it, but it shows that the Holy Spirit is more than willing to give us the grace. Sometimes that grace is just comes in wisdom to how to receive from him. You know, Paul said in, in the book of Acts, I, I mentioned that he, he said, he was speaking to the leaders of the church at Ephesus. He said, you know, my ministry is to solemnly testify of the grace of God. He goes on later in that same passage, a few verses later, and he, and he says to these leaders, he said, and now I commend you to God 
and to the word of his grace, the message of his grace, which is able to establish you and to give you the inheritance. See, we receive the inheritance among all those who are sanctified, which are believers. We, re- we even receive the inheritance by grace. We're established by grace. And when I say grace, you, I'm talking about what Christ has done. That's the grace of God, what he's provided. And the, and, and the biggest enemy to that is, as I mentioned earlier, is religion and trying to earn it and trying to work for it. It is something to be received. The scripture talks about Jesus received sinners gladly. They loved being around him. Matter of fact, if you're here this morning and you look at your life and you say, the, the things I have done are so bad, I'm telling you, Jesus says to you, I'll gladly receive you. I'll gladly receive you. You're, you're, you're my kind of people. I feel Jesus felt more comfortable around, around sinners than he did around the religious. You can find, if you read through it, you can get this feeling. He was so comfortable. Now, he was pretty comfortable throwing some dings out at the religious, but I'm telling you, he, he was perfectly at home with, with, with those who, who, were, who, who were the worst of society. And the amazing thing is, they were perfectly at home with him. Now, he doesn't leave people in that state. He forgives them. He gives them new life. He gives them a new start. Uh, there used to be a song, God of the Second Chance. My goodness, he's, he's more than the second chance. If, we're only, if we're only, we only get to say two choices, two chances, brother, I'm sunk. And so are most of y'all. He's, he's not the God of the second chance. He's the God of the new life. He's the God of the new heart. He's a God that will take the worst of the worst and freely give you his life. Listen, I'm going to say something here. He is not after, and, and hear what I say, when, hear what I mean by this. We hear, you know, give Jesus your heart. He's not after, he, it's not that he wants to use your heart. He wants to give you his heart. He wants to take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. He's not interested in your great commitments and, and your great promises. He's interested in giving you new life. He's interested in giving you new life. So this morning, I don't know where you find yourself. I'm gonna close. I don't know where you find yourself. But the message of Christ was go into all the world and preach the gospel. Announce this great grace of God that I have paid the price for every sin that ever was committed or ever would be, that I've suffered the punishment that mankind deserves, that I took that all upon myself. I was beaten, I was whipped, I was killed, and I was laid in a grave, and I rose from the dead, and I'm alive forevermore. And whoever believes that message can have new life. I'll come to live in them, to dwell in them, to give them new life. And he extends that to you this morning. If you're here and you don't know God, you're lost, you know that. He extends that invitation to you for new life. And for believers here this morning, wherever you find yourself, he extends that same grace for whatever area of need you have. It's been secured. It's been secured in his blood. It's been secured in his sacrifice. And whatever, wherever you find yourself in need of the grace of God, and we're all there, he extends that too and says, whosoever will, you can have it. You can have it, whatever it is. You need healing, you can have it. You need freedom in your mind, you can have it. You need joy, you can have it. It's there for the taking, folks. Well, really, it's there for the receiving. So um, I want to close in prayer. And I've, I've, I've run a little over, but I don't want to give pastor an opportunity to, to, if he wants to give an invitation or, or whatever, but I, but I, I want to be mindful of, of people's time. And I hate time. But Lord, I just pray right now. I mean, I don't, but I do. I, I, let's stay till two o'clock today. Let's stay till two o'clock and just see what God wants to do. Hallelujah. Oh, man, I tell you. Father, I'm, I'm joking, Pastor. I saw those panic look in his eyes. <laughs> Lord, I'm just teasing. But Lord, I just pray right now for us. You see us. We are all needy in some area. Father, and I just pray right now that we would just be partakers of the grace of God. Help us, show us how to receive from you, how to receive from the grace of God, how to receive from your spirit, Lord, right now. Lord, I just ask that you would meet each person here 
where they need it, God. Hearts that need to be healed, Father. Not, not hearts that need to be coped with, hearts that need to be healed. Bodies that need to be healed. People that need to experience you in their hearts that need to be born again, Lord. May they receive this gospel and simply call on you and believe right now, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.